better. Okay, this is Dirk Knudsen and I am doing another oral history today with some other Washington County longtime residents. Um, I'm going to ask you both your name and a little bit about yourselves and your families to start, if that's okay. So let's start with the young lady on my left. Can I have your name and um, uh, just tell me your name and I'll ask you questions from there. Jean Log and my maiden name was Barnes. Okay. It's a little too loud. Hang on while I make a slight adjustment. Okay, Jean. Jean mm -hmm. Long, and you were Jean Barnes. Yes. Okay. And on my right, sir, can I get your name? Stanley L. Long, L-O-N-G. Not short, but long. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we have Jean and Stanley Long today of Washington County. Um, we are up on Greener Road, which is about as far north in Washington County as one can get. No, you can still go two miles up. Dead End Road. <laughs> yeah, looking at the maps, there were two sections left above us. And those are mile apiece. And, uh, you folks have 40 plus acres here? Yes. 43 plus. And how long have you been up here on Greener Road? 1964 we moved up here. That was a good piece ago. And it's kind of the same up here, isn't it? Except for uh, we only had two neighbors at the end of the road and now we've got uh, eight, eight pe people. You got eight people at the end of the road? Well, between here and the end of the road. There's eight other people. And the road does end up there? Yes. Past that is Columbia County. If the gates were open, you could go through to Pumpkin Ridge. But okay. the guy that owns the property at the end of Pumpkin Ridge keeps the gates locked. So you came up here in 64. So now that we know who you are um, and that you've been here on Greener Road a long time, let's go all the way back. I'm going to start with you, Gene. I want you to tell me where you were born, uh, who your mom and dad are, and any siblings you have. I was born in Hillsboro at the hospital, the old Jones Hospital, and we lived in, uh, at that time, in Cornelius. My dad taught school there, Warren Barnes, um, for eight years. And then um, when I was just a toddler, we moved to Forest Grove on Willamine Avenue. Okay. And uh, we lived there for um, probably over 10 years. We had a chicken farm and my dad had a um, little shop in Forest Grove on Main Street where he repaired refrigerators, wash machines, and stuff like that. And uh, I went to Central School, Lincoln School, and then Forest Grove High School. Uh, now it's the Catholic Church. That's the high school I went to. So I have uh, my oldest brother was uh, Warren Barnes. They called him Bud, who was the sheriff. And then my sister, Joyce, married Ted McLean. And <clears throat> my, uh, then I'm in the middle. And then my brother Bill um, married Linda Wells of Hillsboro, and mm -hmm. then Don, my youngest brother, and uh, he lives in Hillsboro. He worked for PGE, retired from PGE, and his first wife was Nora, and they had three boys, and now he's married to Nancy Dickey, um, and he's the only one left alive besides myself, just huh. Don and myself. From the kids? Yeah. You didn't mention your mom. My mom was Leora Haney from the Thatcher area. And uh, the grandparents, 
uh, back on mom's side is where Thatcher Road got its name. And um, beyond that generation was um, David's. So David Hill, we always claim, was named after one of their grandparents too. But there's always a, a little question whether it was David the one connected in Hillsborough? Yes, I've heard this. our relative out there. My sister did quite a bit of... So that needs to be resolved yet, you think? Oh no, my sister, she she took care of that and she still is was convinced that David's Hill out there was our great, great, let's see, great, great, great grandparents. Yeah. Wow, so they would have been so, settlers, early yes, pioneers. They came in uh, covered wagons. And their last name was David? David and uh, Thatcher's. Okay. Yeah. That would be easy enough to establish with the maps that are around now. There's a lot of great history that's been preserved and they've actually found a lot of things from the past that they thought were gone. Nowadays with computers they're starting to get everything on databases where it's making it easier. Mm -hmm. um, so you have just an unbelievably rich history. The Haney's, I recognize the name from the trucking company. My mother was a Haney before she married. And they built quite an empire. Uh, yes, they it did. It seemed like it. I mean, when we were kids, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing a Haney uh, truck. Um, Big Grady shipped by Haney. Yeah. <laughs> and it seems like after that, Stuart Stiles came along and that was Stuart Stiles trucking but I felt like that was Haney somehow. No. Yeah, but no. that, and that's my... That's on his leg. That's one of my first cousins. So, <clears throat> before we finish up on your background, uh, your father was Warren? Warren, yes. And my brother was Warren Jr. Was your father known as B.W.? That was my grandfather. That was my dad's. That would be this gentleman. Oh, that's a nice picture. I brought that for you. Wow. There's a picture of B.W. Barnes in 1939 with his feet on his desk on the last day of his, his employment as with uh, the Hillsborough School District. Oh, I was there that day. <laughs> and uh, he is, and as you well know, and he's a historical figure. Um, here is, uh, and I just handed her a picture of her grandfather, B.W. Barnes, and uh, he was quite a, quite an educator by all by all accounts that I've read. Um, so that gives your family quite a prominence in the community. And when historians look back, of course, they're looking for people who did either famous or infamous things. Um, I have another picture of him for you because I have a yearbook from 1937 that I was posting pictures of, and he's in that on my Facebook page. And so he's the superintendent in 37, and I have a nice picture of him in the school yearbook. Um, also, along those lines, here is the the Barnes home, uh, which was in the 80s was owned by Trinity Lutheran Church. Um, this says this is his home on Main Street. That look like Grandpa's house? Yeah, we yeah. So I'm going to leave this packet for you about your grandfather. Um, the historians that wrote this in the 80s did uh, a little on him, said that he bought that property on 545 East Main Street. He bought it in 1908 from F.M. Heidel. House was built in 1908, they think, or about that same time. B.W. Barnes was born in Ohio in 1867. He married in 1896 to Minnie Warren. Right. Sound right? The daughter of the Hillsboro pioneers, Ed and Ruth Warren. So there's a lot of prominence on Dad's side. Ed Warren was originally from Indiana. His wife, Ruth, from Illinois. Minnie herself was born in Oregon. She and B.W. had one son, Bert Warren Jr. That would be your dad. Yes. Uh, B.W. graduated from Teachers College in Lincoln, Nebraska. He was originally hired to work in Hillsboro for a one-year term teaching elementary school. In 1904, he was appointed principal and ninth grade instructor when they finally added a ninth grade. Barnes taught English, Latin, and algebra and history. He was elected to several terms at county school superintendent in 1912, became superintendent of the entire Hillsboro School District in 1916. He was also the first principal of Hillsboro Union High School. Retired in 1939, there's the picture. 
He was a very well-respected educator. He has the distinction of having a school named after him, B.W. Barnes Elementary School, which we know that, uh, well, it's, parts of it are still there, but it's changed a lot. So I'm yeah. going to leave this whole history for you. For me? Yep, that's your copy. Well, thank you very and much. And then on your side of the family, before, oh, so these people are Haney's. There's a historic picture of them, and I've got, I don't know if that's Fred, but this was supposed to be a Haney with an undisclosed wife. And I have a little history on that I can give you, but I, I'm, that one I'm still digging on. There's not a lot of published history on the Haney's out on the public web where us historians look at stuff, but I'll find out more about that picture. Hmm. And then I did find an amazing, um, of course, just an unbelievable, uh, if you don't have a copy, that's your, oh. your brother? Uh-huh. Yeah, I actually met him a few times. I wasn't on the wrong side of it either. I remember he was, he was sheriff for a long time in Washington County, and he had, uh, he had, boy, what a career he had in in the military and after. Yeah. Do you want a copy of that, or you have that? Um, I'll take it if you have an extra copy. That's for you. Yeah. Uh, so you. Bud Barnes was a sheriff for, uh, gosh, eighteen I think three, years. Three terms, uh, I think. Altogether, twenty some years. He was a deputy. Okay. In it talks about in there. He became a deputy. What? Nineteen fifty-one. Right that's after what it we said. got married. Yep. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's it, what it says in there. It, and then uh, he hired one of my cousins because he was an outlaw. Did he? Well, um, so takes an outlaw to catch an outlaw. <laughs> I won't get into that. Joking. There were some things. Chuck Sherritt was his name. Okay. Well, you know, was he really an outlaw? No. No. Okay. Well, Let's he not. did a lot of things illegally growing up. Okay. So he pretty well knew. A perfect guy to become a lawman because he understood how what to, kids were doing yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. Um. Well, you have, uh, whether you know it or not, I mean, this uh, really rich history on your family. Uh, big, big, some big movers and shakers in Washington County history, both uh, business, education, and other things. Thank so let's you. jump over to the young man on your left, uh, Stan, uh, Stan Long. And Stan, could you uh, tell me where you were born and your mother and father and any heirs you have? And how, uh, how, uh, where did you come up from and all that? I was born someplace in King County. I have no idea where, uh, which is up Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. My father was Clifford Long. My mother was Teresa Vandersanden from Forest Grove. Okay. Big family. Big, big family. They were. Had, there was 10 of us in the family. My mother died at childbirth mm. when I was seven years old. Delivering one of your brother and sisters? My sister. Your sister. Youngest sister. Gosh. And you and were young. I was seven years old. Wow. And uh, I class myself in our family as survivors. Yeah. My father worked at a lot of jobs when he was younger. Mm -hmm. uh, Self-educated engineer. Worked for the city of Seattle with running survey crews mm -hmm. for 18 years before he retired and went to work for private companies. Uh, he was in World War One, and Mr. Barnes, the superintendent of public schools, offered him a high school diploma if he'd go to college, and he offered my uncle, Judge Donald E. Long in Portland, a scholarship if he would go to college. My dad would not go to college, but my Uncle John uh, Donald did. 
When the Longs grew up in Hillsboro. My grandfather, according to our history, bought the paper in Hillsboro in 19, I believe it was 05, but we're not positive. Mrs. McKinney worked for my grandfather when she was 16 years old. And he bought, she bought the paper from my grandfather, who was L.A. Long in Hillsborough. Wow. And when my grandfather was retired and everything, he did a lot of work at the Washington County Courthouse. Just what, I don't know. And they knew each other, my grandfather and his grandfather. I picked up on that. <laughs> Their two lives intersected. Mm -hmm. Well, they... They the, meshed, their lives meshed together. Their families knew each other. My, gra my dad ran around with, uh, come on, help me out, which... One of your, one of your siblings? Walt, Walt McKinney, McKinley. Oh, the McKinneys, yeah. McK yeah. So they, you're saying, you're stating, and I believe, I have no reason to disbelieve you, that your father, your father, L.A. My grandfather. Your grandfather, L.A., founded the Hillsborough Argus. The Hillsborough Argus. Was it called the Argus then? No. no. It was the... Was it I the think Observer? it was called the Independence. Yes. Okay. This all makes sense now. Okay. And along comes Mrs. McKinney. And to be a woman and to do what she did was quite something. Yeah. But to know that she took the warm hand off of a newspaper from your grandfather that, that must have seen a lot in her. He must have seen the ability to report the news and to run a newspaper. Um, we know what happened after she got it because the Argus became the staple of Washington County, this part of the county, for right. many decades. We used to have somebody in the Washington County that would uh, do a lot of articles on L.A. law. Okay. Because he was... Uh, he was as outspoken as my grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is, uh, this is something we need to... Um, uh, I need to contact Liza at the museum because as of right now, I could not find any reference to L.A. Long in their database, and that would be a shame. So I'm sure it's there. The copies of the Independent are over there in big bound books. If you ever want to visit the museum, uh, they will pull those out, and you're more than welcome to read through them. They're, you have to use white gloves because the paper's very old. But I'm, uh, I've been going through the old Arguses, just having a ball reading about my time, and then I've been back in the 30s and around the... Uh, I've been looking for some information about a couple of stories I'm working on that date back into the 1900 era prior to World War I, and, and the Arguses are over there up till about 60... 68 or 70 and then they stopped binding them and then at the end here the Oregonian as you know bought the Argus to with the intent of putting it down like a, like a sick yeah. horse and they got rid of it so they didn't have a competitor and when they got rid of it they dumped a lot of that history and luckily there's a woman down in Hillsboro at the arcade bookstore that she found bound books from the 60s 70s and 80s of the Argus that Ooh. they were going to throw out and these are the dailies that go into a giant leather book to keep an original. So she's got from 1950 through 19... In fact, you guys would like those because that would be your era when you were getting married and coming up. But anyway, that's a great history on uh, your grandfather. And then, so L.A.'s your grandfather. Your dad's name again is? Clifford. Clifford. Clifford Leon Long. And your... And your L.A.'s, uh, his name was uh, Luce. L.A. Long was... Uh, Al Francis or something in the middle. Would you think... Uh, Luce, Lucius something. Would I, you think that might be your dad there? Oh, we, oh, have, we yes. got it. Uh, no. Clifford Long is supposed to be number seven. He's like right over... I'm going to say that's number seven... One of those two right there. It's got it written on his chest. You no, know, we've got a picture like that someplace. Yeah, we do. So here's who's in the picture with him. 
Uh, this is a baseball picture that was donated by Vern McKinney in 1966 to the museum, and they still have it. At, they still have the original of that. So he's got uh, Bill Nelson is number one, Kenneth Himpler number two, Robert Embry is number three. That's a well-known name. Charlie Wilkes or Charlie Ward, they're not sure. Ralph Ireland is the manager. We probably know that name, right? Mm -hmm. Number six on there is Vern McKinney. Okay. Well, we know Vern McKinney went on to be the editor chief of the Argus, right? Sit down. Would have been his mom. That would have had. Would Vern McKinney's Vern. mom been? Uh, is it Cla what is her first name? Is it Clara or? Anyways, I'll f I know that story. So there's a lot. Of, there's a. There's a. That's the backside of that photograph. Oh, okay. And if you could make sense out of it. So, Deanna, before you run off, why don't you be a maid? You can give coffee. me a cup of coffee, please. And do you guys Thank like, you. Do you guys want some lemon? No, the blue cup over there. I'll get that in a minute. So the Long family then, now you were in Seattle when your mom passed and had the child and all that. You folks were in Seattle. The whole family was. There were 10 of you, 10 children in the Long family. And when did the Long family come back to Hillsborough? Well, the Long family never did come back to the Hills. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I had uh, my oldest brother went into the help fight a war before the war started. Okay. My next brother went into the Navy. Uh, I went in to the you might say the Coast Guard on merchant ships yeah. when I was probably, I should have been a freshman in high school, but no, we had a war to fight. And you got to be a merchant marine. I was in the merchant marine under the Coast Guard. You were probably too young to enroll straight into the Army or the Navy, weren't you? I couldn't pass the eye test in the Navy. Gotcha. I, they said I was colorblind because they have numbers and you gotta figure yeah. things out. Right. So he, the recruiting Get some more. guy in the, uh, for the Navy, he said, you know, he said, uh, I realize you're not young, old enough to be here, but I would take you in if you could pass that eye test. So what you want to do is go down and he gave me a name. He said, go down there and see this guy and uh, tell him I sent you. And he'll sign you up and you can go to Catalina Island and take training under the Coast Guard. What year would that have been, do you think? What? About what year was that? I have no, I don't remember those okay. years. This is this is World War II. World War II. And what year were you born? 1928. Okay. May 14th. And, and you so were about 15 or you were, 16. It was 42 or 43. You were getting, we were getting ready to go to war. I... Or we were at war. When the war ended, I should say when the war supposedly the last firing, I was in the South Pacific. And I didn't realize at the time that I was really under the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So I decided that, well, I spent two years, two and a half years in the Merchant Marine, took supplies to Europe, whatnot. I decided I'd jump, I better get an education someday. So I jumped in the army and spent three years in Japan occupation. I was with Sagamo Prison when Tojo was hung. Wow. I was the next witness if anybody backed out. We had to have so many witnesses to every Execution. Wow. So you were there and, in uh, Japan. I just missed that. 
And then I left Sagamo and went to the Harbor Patrol. I was military police at Sagamo and a military police at Harbor Patrol. I ran a five foot. I also ran what we called a piece of plywood that we called the Counterintelligence Corps. We went out and grabbed the uh, ships coming in that were bringing cocaine and stuff from China and dumped them. And we'd apprehend them. Wow, what an experience that must have been. Um, so that's three years after the war. You well, supposedly no, ended. The war officially did not end until November of 1947. Thank you. People will always think the war ended. It did not end until November of 47. I think the way they talk about it is when the emperor or whoever signed that on the is it Missouri or the Mississippi, they signed the surrender. They signed the surrender, but the, everything had to be down pat. Yeah. And MacArthur, who to me was the best general that this country had for years, mm -hmm. and uh, if Harry Truman hadn't have fired him during Korea, we wouldn't have had a Vietnam. I, my opinion, and a lot of other guys, because we were not fighting North Korea, we were fighting China. MacArthur wanted to keep going. Right. Truman said no. Because he saw MacArthur saw communism oh, he knew on the rise. What was happening? Yeah. And that I spent time. I've been back to Japan. I've been up there, and they have a big museum where MacArthur's headquarters were. And Deanna spent seven years there. The Chinese or the Japanese people, when I talked to them back several years back, told me that MacArthur was the best thing that ever happened to Japan. Well, he helped to get they going made again. a country out of him that was independent, mm -hmm. where people weren't being dictated to. Well, they'd been at war for forever and been suppressed people, right? Yeah. So they, they became a good example of what democracy can do once people are free. Well, thank you for your service, number one. My grandfather and my old my dad's oldest brother were merchant marines, and they were out over there, same, same area. My uncle Lloyd would have been about your age. He passed away about five years ago, mm. and he got the full military thing up at the Willamette National, or, mm -hmm. and that was pretty neat. That is my boys. I have three boys, and for them to go put that connection in their mind, put their uncle in that, in that hearse, and do the military burial rites. That really, they 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 didn't know a lot about him, and that really made them want to understand more. And they were much more respectful about his history because he was a little distant from the family. How he old, like how old were your boys? Well, I have a twenty nine, a twenty seven, and eighteen. But that would have been a couple years back. So it was mm -hmm. it was a they, they were all there with, I just have a picture of them all with his casket, and they, then they wanted to know a lot more. Tell me a lot more about Uncle Lloyd. <laughs> and he had quite a history, like a, lot of the, like a lot of you guys did that went over and served and, you know, then took those skills. And yeah. Yeah. For you to stay there, though, was something, huh? What made you stay? What? what? You could have come home, I guess, but I, you stayed. His girlfriend? <laughs> uh oh. Was it your girlfriend? No, honey. I, I, I did, you know, <laughs> let me give you a little bit of history of me. Out of the ten of them, there's five that have been in the service. So that's a pretty good record. Yeah. For ten. I left school up there when I should have been, a, when I was a freshman. And then when I ended up in Catalina Island, they taught me how to swim through burning oil, how to take lifeboats off 
a ships and take control, how to shoot 20 millimeters, five inches, three inches, and all that. My first trip, the reason I got my first trip was because I had a lifeboat ticket. Every ship sailing had to have so a percentage enough, I can't remember, I think it was 65% of the crew had to be able to man the lifeboat. <coughs> Okay. I got on a ship. We had, uh, I don't know how many thousands of gal uh, barrels of high octane gas wow. for patrol yeah. boats. Right. I think we had three <coughs> uh, PT boats that we took over and left. So it wasn't. You know, if anything had happened, we'd have been one of the big first they would right. have gone for in right. a convoy. Right. And I learned all this. Then I went to, and then I re-enlisted in Japan. I was going to stay, and then at the last minute I decided that, no, I better get out of here because I'm drinking way too much, mm. which is not good. Right. And because of where I was, I could just go like that. Yeah. Most people got to go through the channels, but we bypassed the channels because I was Harbor Patrol. Uh -huh. I knew everything on there. Yeah. So it was easy. And I came back. So. And I fought the Korea War in my dreams for two years because I should have been there with all those guys oh that was in my outfit that went there. Wow. And then I met her. Yeah, I was going to say, so you're coming home from your time in the service in Japan and you came back to Seattle or did you come back here? I came to uh, I came to Washington Square here. <clears throat> or Washington, Washington Square. To County. Washington County. I live mostly and my address was in Forest Grove at one of my uncles. My Van, youngest Van and uncle? my mother's youngest brother. Okay. Very close. And I made relations. that's my family. And my his one of their daughters married John Stiles who or John Davis who is took over Stuart oh, Stiles. Okay. Truck That's right. Yeah. Yeah, the Davis family, I, you and, know, uh, I know them a but, little bit. Uh, I got a lot of history here. Yeah, you do. So when you came home, you went to the Van Der Zanden place out in Forest Grove. Uh, Teresa, so the Van Der Zandens are a huge family, so I don't even know where that family starts, but is your mother at the, at the forefront of that? Was it her dad? Which Van Der Zanden came first and planted the Dutch flag here in Washington County? Which one? Yeah. Three brothers came here. And I'm on the John Van Der Zanden side. Okay. Who settled uh, in Banks. And he lived one mile north of Banks. I think it was up on the hill there. Yeah, okay. It started a, a farm up there. Okay. Do you know Eretz er, er, Road used to be Van Der Zanden Road? Eretz Road? And that's the road they would come down <clears throat> in the wagon to go there. Yeah, I'm pretty familiar that there is a Van Der Zanden farm. <clears throat> My, is it north of Banks or west of Banks? It's coming this no, way. It's, it's not north west. North and west. Banks Road. It's, uh, there's Banks Road, Banks Road it's comes over the hill. Behind the golf course. Northeast is up on the hill. Yeah. Gotcha. Is where they were. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I want to say that family might have owned the land where the golf course is now. I have to check my notes because my dad... It might have been. Cause my dad, right I think his clients were the Van Der Zandens and he sold the land where Quill Valley Golf Course is. And the Van Der Zandens at least owned part of that. That would be about on the top of the hill on the south or maybe both sides because the van der zennens i usually think of are the roy mm -hmm. verbort 
North Forest Grove. Yeah, that's it. You know it's where Fishback's Nursery is yes. right now? Yeah, they moved out there. My mother was born in the old house there. That place used to belong to... Uh, help me out. Nope, I uh, can't get it. I'll think of it in a minute. So the Vander Zannons that are real active around Washington County are like Bob, he's a farmer over on Jackson School. Tom is a big land guy who's doing a lot of these land dealings around Washington That's County. That's all cousins. Those are cousins, okay. Mm -hmm. The Tulip Farm. Yeah. That's really he's said, Bob. from my side, Okay. my grandfather's side, great-grandfather's yeah. side. He's right there on Jackson School. Mewson, yeah. who, who owned that. Mucins. And my mother, uh, was a haysacker. I mean, no, I your grandmother. Uh, my grandmother. My grandmother was a haysacker, and my grandfather was a Vanderzen. Okay. That's how mom gets her. That's mom's family. That's Teresa's mom and dad. And on Highway 47, coming out of Forest Grove. There was Andy and Teresa Van der Zanna, and then there was Uncle Paul by the like, ditch. But they are now building houses like crazy. Yeah. And then his cousin Susie Davis lives in the Purple House with a roundabout. In yeah. There. Then the next one is Rod and Maxine, and that's where he took up residence when he was. Um, Okay, so when yeah, you came back, stars. you went to one of the Van der Zanden yeah. family homes. Did they have a room for you? They said, hey, welcome back, nephew, or yeah. you know, hugs all around. And and he helped him farm. I helped my uncle do a lot of farming and repair and equipment on his place and whatnot. But even when you were a kid, you came and helped with farming. Mm -hmm. What? You came down when you were a kid and helped in the in summer. In the summer. When I was a child, yes. When you were a child, not a kid. So tell, I went to I went in to tell you about bringing the hay in from uh, to Uncle Paul's barn. Oh, yeah, with the big lift the and horses the horses. And this is. Really I was probably let's see. My mother died when I was seven. I could have been eight or nine years old. I'm not positive. But I came down here and stayed with my grandmother. And. My uncles, Rod and Paul, mm -hmm. uh, who were teenagers, both of them, were farming for me, doing the farm work. And they'd take me out, they showed me how to uh, load hay, shock hay on the wagons, because it's very special. You have to tie all that hay in. Then I would drive the team about half a mile to the uh, barn and uh, unhook the horses, and then I'd hook them onto a line, and it would drop teeth down, which I got right out there, into the hay, and the horse would pull it up and go down the road. Talking about the harpoon. Which I have out there. Yeah. The hay harpoon would come down, yeah. and then when you tighten it, the teeth pop out, and it grabs the whole pile, basically. It would grab a big bunch of hay and take it up. And there's I the got pulley. those hanging on the wall. Yeah, right? I got a couple of those hay trolleys and that whole system, and those are just so neat. What a great. Amazing. And they can slide down the, the loft, the and they can spin. Yeah, we have a I have an old dairy farm for sale out in Scappoose right now that was a, one of the biggest dairies in Columbia County and that barn is just amazing. Mm. 1918 barn with its 7,000 square foot loft and the hay trolley still up there. And you can see where the old door folds down yep. so you can uh, that, good lord how it was a, you know dairies where they had to have a lot of hay of course. Yeah. Was that a dairy out there in the Banner Sand? It was a small dairy, probably 30 cows. Uh, and right next door. I, I helped milk cows. I learned that when we were kids at home. Yep. How to milk cows. I handled the horses mm -hmm. very because I was allowed to because I had 
something with horses at that time compared to my cousins that lived here. Yeah. They upset the horses where I didn't. Yeah. So horses. I was allowed to do a. I plowed with them. I clod breakers. I did everything. What man. kind of horses are we talking about? Big, big horses, draft oh, yeah. horses. Draft horses. Draft horses that the, you farmed with. The kind of animals you don't want to get on the wrong side of. But they're pretty gentle horses if you aren't afraid of them, aren't they? Uh, how can I put it? If you're afraid of a horse, yeah. you have problems with that horse. Mm -hmm. If you're not afraid of that horse, the horse knows that immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, that's been my experience. Because if you're intimidated by them, they, they immediately know that. And that was my one of my problems with my cousins. I think they were intimidated. Mm -hmm. Even if they lived down here, and I didn't. I just come on summers. <laughs> well, that's a good story. So, um, the Van Zandt inside, it sounds like, despite Teresa, your mother passing, and I know that had to be just devastating on the family. I don't know how you got through that with all those kids. How, how did the family get by with your mother being lost like that? Well... Tell him about the baby. The youngest one came was shipped down here until she was two years old. The rest of us, uh, my father made sure that uh, we went to school. He made sure that we went to church. Mm -hmm. Because the Vanders and were Catholics. I was going to say your Catholic family, right? He made sure, and I don't, my father, I don't believe, was a Catholic. But he made sure we always went to church and we worked mm. at home. He taught us how to work. We had a cow, rabbits, garden. Up everything. in King County. You had a, in yeah. King County. You had a little land up there, did you? We had three and a half acres where the... Uh, used to be, they had stills and made whiskey on that property. Where was that at, roughly? Roughly, our place overlooked the Duwamish Valley. We could look down and see all the truck gardens. We were just off a of military road, uh, which would be about three miles from South Park, or the Boeing Airfield. Okay. So, kind of between, uh, I know that area somewhat, so that's like the Kent Valley on the inland side? Is that okay. the Duwamish? That's the Duwamish Valley right below us. And then to the right, we're looking east. Towards to the, the right Towards the mountains. is uh, Renton, okay. where the racetracks used to be. Right. Kent was further south than Puyallup. Okay, was yeah. Further south. Yeah, I know some longs from Renton. Could be your f distant family. Well, let me put this this way. Technically and legally, our name should be Crandall, not Long. Oh. Well, now you're going back into the. Back in the early yeah. Well, Crandall, the Crandall name I know from the donation land claim maps, that's, like way back. That's, that's During the Civil War, my grandfather, great grandfather got wounded at Shiloh. Okay. And he worked, uh, he had worked in the woods and, uh, he was tall, six foot something, and they called him uh, Long Jack because he was so tall. But two brothers got into it over a female. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so he changed his name and went to Long, Long because he had to have a legalized lane for, to get a land grant from Civil War after being wounded. And a family had raised him when he was seven years old by the name of Long. And so he took that name. 
And that's the name that came out here. So the Crandalls were back east. Yeah. Somewhere. And gotcha. Then one of the Crandalls and the, our family on my on that side were sea baron people. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of grand uncles that were skippers of sailing ships. I call them pirates. Mm. They took what they want during the Revolutionary War. Right. They fought for the United States. And one of them came all the way out here, came up the Columbia River to Portland, and then uh, according to history now, her sister found this out. In a raging snowstorm, he walked to Hillsborough to my grandfather's place. Wow. His name was Kenyon Crandall. Kenyon Crandall. I got an article in here. Wow. And he died here. In 1912. In fact, when his health was failing, he moved in to the house with L.A. Long, the, in the house there, and uh, he died in that house because his health health. Kenyon did. Kenyon Crandall. And someplace south of Hillsboro, he had a farm. It's all we, but we've never been able to figure out. When do you think he got to Hillsboro? Was he here for a while before he died? Are we talking eighteen late eighteen hundreds maybe or? Well, we'll, well, we'll we can, have to we can connect it's on that. In, it's okay. in the records back there. All right, so let's take a little pause there for a second. And either of you need a break, or can we go for a little longer? Right. You're getting going. I'm okay. Drinking coffee. I'm here until. Uh, Probably sometime tonight. Until it quits raining. You know, don't forget the Powells. Oh. Yes, the there's Powells. A, there's a Powell. The Powells <laughs> family came out here by wagon train in the uh, 1850, 51, 52, I believe it was. And let's see. You're handing me a book here for those that will listen to this uh, in the future. Okay. What was Grandma's name? Which one? Jane. Jane? Yeah, Jane, Jane Powell. Powell. Jane Powell's mother came on a wagon train out here in 1847, from what I understand. This says, Alfred and Noah Powell came across the Oregon Trail in 1851. That's on the, the Powells. Yeah. This is uh, the one that came out here in 1847 was uh, her mother. Okay. If I remember right now, without checking records. Okay, yeah. And... Uh, they came out here and they settled or they stopped in a little town of Glencoe on the North Plains before they went south. And they went south and then they ended up uh, going over the hill to, I think it was Hebel, and they built one of the first sawmills. And she married a pal who built the first sawmill on the coast. So how is this connected to your family? Well, my it'd be my grandfather's wife. Okay. L.A. Long's wife is... L.A. Long, okay. L.A. Long's wife was, yeah. is, was a pal. Yes. Who was a pal. And her mother was the umplet. That came over on the wagon train. Boy, this book is quite a piece of. There's a there's a book I'm holding on uh, the Powell family. Yeah, and they are uh, they are quite a group. Several waves of Powells came out here, and then they all were connected. They probably all you have Probst, Peeler, Powell. There's multiple families, but this is quite a quite a family to be connected to. I should say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's that. There's that family tree of the Powells. 
Because I recognize the Powell name from Washington County. Margaret Jane Powell. Lucius yes. Alcifran Long, yeah. is that right? Mm -hmm. L.A. Long, born 6-8-1867. That's your grandpa. Um, the, uh, can you, uh, I'm going to, when I'm all done here today, I'm going to take a picture of that. Okay. Uh, so L.A. That's where I get my middle name. Okay. Luscious. Luscious. Because <laughs> you're luscious like that, huh? That was what. When I went to school, that's all I heard. Because oh, my really? name was Lucius. Everybody said Luscious. They didn't know how to pronounce it. Of course not. Um, the uh, Did L.A. Long have a house down in Hillsboro? Yep. Do you know where it was? I, if you... I'm try, now, let's see. i got to get on the right streets because they... Messed them all up. It, yeah. was, it was only about five blocks from my grandparents. Okay. My, my grandparents were on Maine. Yeah, and I have a picture of that house. Yeah. And, and I it, think uh, maybe it was only three blocks. Maybe north of there, you think? Uh, more uh, towards no. West. West. Past downtown? Let's see. The hospital. And two blocks... Down, second going towards Forest Grove. I believe it was two blocks, right on the corner. The house is not there anymore. Sure, right, right on the corner, and that was my grandfather's house. Okay, so L.A. Uh, had the house. He, your father was raised there. What what happened to your dad? What what was your dad's? Just a little more on your dad. When where did he live, and what did he do before he passed on? He went south. Well, let's see. Start out with my dad after the war. Mm -hmm. Came back to Hillsboro. Which war he, was that then? World War One. He traveled around. Uh, working jobs like in Eastern Oregon, loading 100-pound sacks of grain into railroad cars, piece work. Mm -hmm. uh, worked for a uh, survey and crew, the National Geographic, uh, no, it's not Geographic, it's another name, that surveyed for the whole. U.S. Geological Survey. Yes. USGS. He, he worked for them. And according to history, I'll tell you how my dad met my mother. She was working in a little restaurant across the street from the courthouse. My father came into the restaurant one night to eat. And there was a guy in there, a young guy, given my mother, who was a waitress, a very bad time. <laughs> my dad did not like that. Mm -hmm. And he told him that to knock it off. And the guy said, who's going to make me? My dad got up, grabbed him, and threw him through the front window, out on the, broke the glass out onto the sidewalk. Right down on Main Street somewhere. The only reason I know this is because when Bud was sheriff, uh, Deputy, was that Bradley? She, never, she might remember. Anyway, the deputy said to me, when we were that, sitting there talking one day at the sheriff's office, he said, just a minute, Stan, I got some history. So he went and got this book, and he said, here's where they threw your dad in jail mm. and why it was written down there. <laughs> That's the only reason I know that is because, and uh, that's a very old name, too. The deputy's name? Yeah. Their history there in Hillsboro. 
your mother re would remember. I, so your dad... Your I'm dad starting will, to forget. It's okay. You're names. almost 90, huh? Your 90th birthday's coming up. Yes. Well, happy 90th, not quite. Enjoy not quite. your 80s while you can. What? I said enjoy your 80s while you can. <laughs> well, according to most people, I'm not 90. I'm Younger. I'm back in my late 60s and early 70s. There's nobody can come close to my age when look at me without a few clues. Yeah, you, you don't look, your skin is still, you know, supple. You look, you look younger. I'd say I, late, I'd say mid. I take no type of any prescriptions at all. Good. Keep it that way if you can. And, oh, I won't take them. I don't care what anybody says. If I, if they thought I would need them, I wouldn't take them anyway. And thanks to you and a few others, I've got these hearing aids that are some of the best I've ever had through the veterans. Good. I'm glad. And you can the hear first, it. when I went to the, I just went to the veterans last year. I had to get a doctor. I've been there, uh, signed up for years. And the first thing the doctor said was, what took you so long to get here? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? You're not on his charts. He said, you're a World War II veteran. Why haven't you been here before? Because I felt at that time I had enough money to pay and then I decided that I was throwing $1,600 away every year, paying Kaiser when I could go to veterans for nothing. So that's why I'm at the veterans. Well, I wish, uh, I wish you many more years of good health. Well, and according to this, the Chinese guy I was talking with down at the state fair, he said, I'm going to be 120. But I, I said, I'm not going to hang around that long. <laughs> What's the sheriff deputy's name that was Bud's uh, deputy, the one that told me about Dad? The story about the front of the window. Bradley? No. no. A very common name in, the in Hillsborough. Hillsborough, but I can't think of it right now. Did you ever know uh, Bill Probesfield? Oh, Probesfield, yeah. He took over sheriff, I think, after Bud. Right. Oh, yeah. He just passed recently up in the Dallas, and his daughter and I graduated together, and we're good friends, and he was a good sheriff, too. You know why Bud left? Well, not really. He wouldn't run for a long time. He, <laughs> he would not let politics tell him what to do. All right. That's when he quit. When the county started crying to tell him, you got to do this, 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 he said, no, I'm out of here. Yeah. He got he the said, plans all right. I will run the sheriff's department the way I feel. Good it for should him. be. Yeah. I will not let you, as government officials, tell me how to run it. Yeah, I think that's a problem now, nowadays. And, and that's why he left. And, and he left there and went down to... Tektronics and set up a security system for Tektronics. What a great, what a great uh, history all that is. Okay, yeah. now I've got to bring it back a little bit now to how you two got together because I, I know you're in your 60 plus year of marriage, right? Right. How many years have you been married? Got married in 50. Ooh, that's 68 years. Uh, so I read a little piece the Oregonian did on the secret of your success as a married couple and all that. So did you read that? I read it, yeah. Okay. And that was a nice piece. Um, there's some good advice to take away there, I think, from for do you, people. Do you know Jennifer Willis, the one that wrote it? I I know who she is. I don't know her personally. Very, very nice person. There is only one problem about about that interview. I had to sit and promise. You had to hold your tongue. And I would tell yeah. the truth and not <laughs> joke about things and throw stuff in there. That... Well, okay, so let's let's let me ask uh, let me ask you how you met him Ooh. without him weighing in. Let's okay. see how that goes. Okay. 
We'll go back a ways. Okay, let's go all the way back. My sister was married to his first cousin. His name was Dick Green. And <clears throat> they were, he came home from the ser service and they were playing cards at my sister's house out on Highway 47. And uh, we lived, at that time, my folks and I lived on Main Street in Hillsboro, or Forest Grove. And the phone rang and uh, they wanted me, my sister wanted me to go to the show with them because they had his cousin there who I'd never met. Uh, and they wanted to go into Portland to a show and I, it's a school night and I said, no, I can't do that. And I was developing pictures in the bathroom of my folks' house. I had the, everything all blacked out. And I said, I can't go. I'm in the middle of a project for school. You were a senior in high school. Yeah. You are at Forest Grove High School? Yes. I was, uh, it's in December of 1949. And uh, I was trying to get this project done. So I said no. So pretty soon the doorbell rang. And uh, I had to shut all the lights down. Yeah. <laughs> I knew this was <laughs> December the 8th. 1949? Oh, 50. 50. That's the year we met. In, okay. I mean, January, January. 8th. Of, okay. It's the year yeah. we met. It was January the 8th. Oh, from 50. In 50. This yeah. is when this is happening. This is happening now. Okay. Yeah. And so anyway, they came and they said they would wait for me to finish my project. So I had to pour all my solutions back in my gallon jugs, you know, developing these pictures. And <clears throat> I went off reluctantly to Portland to the show and uh, came home. And that was the first time that we had ever met. So he was at the show? He, he drove. He drove. He had a brand new Plymouth and it was really a nice car. He came home from the service and he paid cash for this brand new Plymouth. So you were probably 18, 17? I was, yeah, 17. You were 23 or 4? I was 21. Okay. Yeah. So we went to the show. And, uh, and this, there's another couple with you now. This is your my sister, sister and her husband. And her husband, Joyce and Dick. Yeah. Were, were they married already? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, they'd been married. And then, how did you know Dick or Joyce? Jo Dick Richard is my first cousin. Okay. Now it all adds yeah. up. Okay. Yeah. So, and they live oh, a couple miles, you know, from where I lived. So anyway, we went to show, and then pretty soon. Um, I didn't it, think. Wasn't it in a snowstorm? Yeah, the snow started snowing and it got pretty dicey coming. Oh gosh! And from Portland. Those big old heavy cars back then. And there was no Sunset Highway. If you look back, that was one of the biggest snowstorms in the area. How did you get to town? You took TV Highway, up over Canyon that yeah. way. Yeah. Oh, uh, we went that way, but come back a different way. It was. Well, tell me what movie you went to. I have no idea. You can't remember? Nope. Didn't matter, huh? People ask me that. Well, let me ask you this. Was your mind on other things? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. So... But I, I had a steady boyfriend. I was going steady with a guy who was in our class at school. Okay. And... Uh, he didn't have a Plymouth, did he? No, he had an old... Almost a Model A, but... And here you have a war veteran in the car with you. Yeah. Did he come... Uh, was, obviously, this was a setup of some sort. <laughs> right? So... Well... Would you come loaded for bear looking to land a wife, or were you just no, coming for a here date? was the thing. I didn't want to go out with her. Okay. She didn't want to go with me. Gotcha. It was... We were pushed together. Huh? Yeah. Sometimes it, well, nowadays it for sure takes a push because kids don't yeah. seem like they want to go meet each other nowadays. And we yeah. went to that movie and come back, and I said, well, I'm going to Seattle in the snowstorm. 
and get me a ship to ship back up. And I, I didn't think I'd I ever see him again. I was so. gone three days, and I come back down here. And I called her up. I said, I got to talk to you. So she come out to the car, sat in the car. And she said, I thought you were going to ship out. I said, yes, but I got thinking about it when I got up there. And I decided that uh, I'd come back and let you know that you and I are going to get married. She laughed at me. I said, I'm going to college. I said, you go to college, get it all out of your system, do whatever you need to do, but just remember, we will get married. And I had already sent in my uh, deposit for Oregon State. I, I mean, was, you hadn't even met each other four days, four days before. Mm -hmm. Really? So why did you think that you were going to marry her? I got thinking about it. I'd been around the world, met a lot of people. Right. And I never saw a female that I would even think about living with hmm. until I met her. So what was it? What about her? Oh, she's a beautiful woman, I can see that. <laughs> but it had to be something Thank else. You. Was she were you afraid that after the war and after the things you experienced, if you went back you might never come back? And therefore she provided a safe harbor for you, kind of? <laughs> Did she save you from yourself? She might have. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You saw a lot of it things. Was, uh, she, she has continued to save him from himself. What? <laughs> she has continued to save you from yourself. So is she your is she your anchor or your yeah. is she your is she your safe harbor? Let's put it that yes, way. Yes, she is. Okay. Otherwise, you might have spun off the planet by now, huh? And so, in the meantime, I broke up with my boyfriend, and we went together. You took this and seriously, this proposal. I did. If you think she's beautiful now. Oh, gosh. I didn't even know who that was the other day. I had to ask her to remind me. So anyway, on my, on my birthday, when I turned 18 in July, then he gave me an a engagement ring. <laughs> and so that kind of settled it. But before that... About Easter time, we were parked in a lane, mm. and we were smooching, and he asked me to marry him, and I couldn't wait to get the lights on in the car to see this ring. It was a chicken ring. <laughs> Do you know what a chicken ring is? See, that's, <laughs> that's a generation gap. It's a plastic ring that they put on chicken's legs oh, okay. sure. to identify them. Okay, I and, got you. And I could not believe that he would trick me like that. So. And I'm still, but, and I'm still pulling crap like that. That's yes. good. That keeps the marriage going, doesn't it? Right. Well, that and you got great faith and everything. So, did you get married that year, fifty? In November. You waited till November. In November. My, yes. Eighth. On his mother's birthday. That's my mother's birthday. I knew that I would never forget <laughs> your anniversary. Our anniversary because yeah. my mother was born that day. And it was on a Wednesday, and it was my dad's day off. Where did you get married at? Verbort Church. Okay. And You're both Catholic, right? At that time? No. No. She I was not. You were. I wasn't. My mom was very upset. I was marrying a Catholic. Well, there was a lot of pushback against uh, different Be groups back then. Because my sister was married to Dick, his cousin, and they were trying to get a divorce. Oh. And we'd never had a divorce in our family. Right. And that was Catholic, and you just didn't do that with a Catholic. And so here we were trying to get married, and they're trying to get divorced. So it was a very upsetting time. But see, he already knew it could work because his dad wasn't Catholic and your mother was, right? Mm -hmm. The Vanners Annans are all devout Catholic. Yeah. They're all involved with the 
visitation school and Roy and the whole Catholic experience. That's right. But Washington County didn't have that big of a Catholic population if it hadn't been for no. those people. It was a smaller no. group out here. And they had that little bitty school. Yeah, it was partly because they didn't come here early. The, Mich the Methodists came out here first with the mountain men and started settling the whole Washington County. So they said they were out here just saving souls and converting the natives, but there was a race on to take up religious dominance, sort of. And the Catholics were affiliated with the Hudson's Bay Company, mm -hmm. with the British, and they were sort of snuggled up with each other. And that was back when we didn't know if we were going to be Oregon, Spanish, or, or we could have gone either way. And thank God the mountain men came to uh, Washington County and put their foot down. Rescued us. Yeah, so you get married uh, in 1950. Oh, that seems like a long time ago. How did how was that in the fifties, and then having kids and all that? How did the family? How did you go from there? Did you get a job here and in, in locally? Uh, did you go to college? You didn't go to college. No, I did not go to college, and he uh, and his cousin, um, <clears throat> even before we got married, they had decided to buy into a service station where McDonald's is in Forest Grove. Mm. As you go in, there mm -hmm. used to be an old service station there. That was their service station. We had it for two years. Okay. Yeah. And till he finally you bought ran him us in the debt so far that uh, you had to it, get him out. Uh, we parted company. Mm -hmm. Biggest mistake: never go into a business with her cousin. So we both worked there. I mean, and I worked uh, there, you know, um, to fill in when they were. He was driving log truck part of the time so for that guy. You did? Yeah. You worked there? <laughs> yes, she did. So how long did you have the service station? Two and a half years. Okay. Yeah. Which, uh, in the end, I was, uh, we were $2,500 in debt mm -hmm. from the Forest Grove National Bank. And hundred and $50 with her. Yeah, well, wait, had, you had kids? With a doctor. So she, she was born when we had the station. What year were you born? 52. February. So who are you? How many kids do you have and what years were they born? 52, 53, 54, 55. All right, give me, give me all the names so I have them down. Deanna, Michael, Gary, and Roderick. Rod. Rod lives up here by you, right? That yeah. house right through there. He was... Rod's 100% disabled. Mm -hmm. He was a Navy SEAL. Wow. But he was 17. Vietnam? Oh, yeah. And whatnot. Yeah. And uh, anyway. That's so uh, when you had the gas station was when the kids were little. Well, that's she was. She born. was the only how one. Were, how old were well, you? Well, no. Were you like three or four years old, or no? Because no. they had it the first two years, right? Yeah. So, so she was born when was we born. had a baby. Station. Yeah, just a baby. A newborn. Okay. Yeah. And I you lived in Forest Grove. No, we lived out at Blooming. Do you know where that yeah. is? Yeah. Okay, we rent a house from a farmer out that way. It's nice out there. And uh, just before where you get to the church and the school yeah. now, just before there, there's a lane to the right. Yeah. And there's a little house, farmhouse down there. Cute little place. So she ran the station, and I was working with a logger. Okay. Learning how to log. Who did you work for? Do you know? Turk Anderson. Okay. And Turk Anderson is the one that started, uh, that bought Sellers Hardware. Okay. And had that for a couple of years. In Forest Grove. And then they, oh, and then we got rid of, they moved south to log. So I'm out of a job because the station were gone and they're gone. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll have to go ship out as much as I don't want to. So that was. So my uncle come and he said, Stan, they need a forklift driver down at. He'll speak lumber company where I'm work where he was working. Go down and talk to Dick McCurdy. So I go down to talk to Dick McCurdy. He says, uh, "So you can drive a forklift?" 
And I said, no, never been on one in my life. <laughs> but I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll run this forklift tonight, unload these cans. If you're not happy with me, don't pay me. So I ran it that night. You picked and it up. I ran quick. it until they shut that mill down. And I just and he said, Go to this mill, Carnation. They need a carrier driver over there for the planer and to unload trucks. So I went over there and worked. Was that in Hillsboro? What? Carnation. 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 In Hillsboro. No. Right. There was Forest a, a oh. small mill in Forest Grove. I gotcha. Okay. You know where that was? Yeah, I think so. There's a lumber company there right now. Okay. It's right on Highway 47 when yeah, you're leaving. So leaving then, Forest Grove. I think it's Par or somebody has lumber there. So all the time I'm working there, at nights I'm driving log truck during the daytime to survive. Working, working your buns off. So now it's still the yeah. 50s, right? This is in... Then he decided to go to... That's when I decided to go to OTI. Clamble Oregon Falls. And become a diesel mechanic. Okay. He put in for the GI Bill. I mean, you're still really young at that point, and you got a family, though, so you're... Well, I was... We were... And when we got married, I was 22. And she's at 18, so... I mean, and you're a young mom. You got four kids back-to-back, -back, I take it? Well, I had... Um, Mike was born just before we left to go to school. Yeah. Moved to Klamath Falls. Mm -hmm. That's the second one. And then Gary was born in Klamath Falls. And then Rod was born. So the whole family went down to Oregon, Klamath Falls, so he could do his education. Yeah. And how did you get by? Did you use the GI Bill or anything for your education? Yeah. I, they paid for my education. But you still had to feed yes. five people we plus yourself. We had a great big garden. Before we left, we had this great big garden, and we canned yeah. and froze everything. And we went to Portland, and we netted smelt. Yeah. And we had them in these big wooden prune boxes, and we cleaned smelt for I think 48 hours straight. You pick them or froze them. Froze them in milk cartons and all, all the containers we could find. So we had this freezer full of stuff. When we went to move to Klamath Falls, we had to rent a UL trailer to carry all of our canned goods and all this frozen stuff and then get down there and rent a locker. Of course, we had a locker rented up here at Hanks, yeah. the old Hanks building. Yeah. And so we took all this stuff down there and we lived on smelt for six months <laughs> before his checks came through. Oh, the kids. Didn't what a time! And to haul and to haul canned goods and smelt from here to Klamath Falls because food was more important than, than gasoline in a car or housing. Now food's cheap and we can't afford gasoline or housing down the valley. <laughs> well, what the hell happened? You know? Isn't that true? Well, housing's gone through the roof, as you guys know. Oh, it's terrible. Uh, when, when I got down there to school, I went in and I said, "Put my name on for a job." because they were doing this, you know. And the gal in charge says, you know, there are no jobs in this town stand, but I'll put your name on. We've been trying to get people to work here, and there just isn't anything that we can get. Right. I said, okay, I'll go get my own job. And within a couple of weeks, I had a job at service station. I had a job at a used car lot. And I had a job at a sawmill. Mm -hmm. All part time. Yeah. The service station guy kept telling me I, he just didn't need anybody. Finally, he says, I'm so tired of you coming here that I'm gonna put you to work on the weekends, part-time. Mm. I'm tired of seeing you. So, me and the other kid that was working there, even and I went to the car lot I was working at, cleaning cars,
We got all their cars down there. We serviced them, took care of them. And then I had the sawmill that I was working part-time at nights. And I had a job. People don't know how to go and get a job and work. Yeah. And keep it. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a lost art. Now they all sit on the internet and put applications in and get told no. Hey. Or they or they're waiting for a dream job or something that's not out there, you know. Or if it is out there, they're going to have to work their way up. You have to go talk to people yeah. and convince them. Got to press the flesh, we call that in business. That's hard to do today. Well, in real estate, most of the people I work with, everything's over the internet. I use the internet daily. I'm as tech savvy as you can be, but you still got to have meetings like this. You got to go knock doors or call and se or maybe send a letter. No one does that anymore either. Yeah. It's a lost art, you know. Well, everything's going to electronics. You guys are living on a bit of an island up there. Uh, you're on a mountain up here, isolated from the general world. And I imagine that's by design. Right? They are learning to use Google. She's, are you really? She's teaching, she's teaching us. Well, when this interview is up, you can send a link to it. <laughs> the biggest mistake we ever had moving up here was surveying this property. Hmm. My dad told me when he was here, he said, Stan, this property is not where you think it is. It has never been properly surveyed. There is no center of the section. Right. You have to have a center of a section. Yep. So we had it surveyed. So the property line run through the corner of this house, through the bunkhouse, through the barn. This was all barrel land management. Yeah, it was all cattywampus, kind of, wasn't it? I can see that by looking at the maps. And we fought the Bureau of Land Management for seven years. The worst people that we encountered to help us was our two state senators in this state. They weren't any help, huh? The Who? one that helped us... Our neighbor up here was uh, Han. Chuck Handlin, who was a state senator. Mm -hmm, yeah. And so he got a hold of Les a coin. Yeah. We talked with Les a coin, and Les a coin went to bat for us. Well, that's good to know. Here's an article. I have an extra copy, so it'll save you a lot of time. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that, that was that. Yeah, I'm going to love reading that. I'm a big land use guy, so uh -huh. I helped. At one time I helped found, I was a co-founder of the group Oregonians in Action, and that's the group that got Measure 39, 37 passed, which was to allow landowners to go back in time and split their ground if they wanted to, because they have denied so many building permits to people who exactly. own land. And then that got changed into Measure 49, and a lot of people took advantage of it and went in and actually divided their land, And but most didn't. Most could not get through all the damned hoops that they did. Too much paperwork. Yeah, in fact, talking about the Meek Place, mm -hmm. the Meek Place down on Dersham, where the big, beautiful red barn is coming up on your right, there's pine trees around, there's a big home there now. So that was, I. that's crop family, right? right? We talked about that. Cousins. But yeah, they noticed they that was a big that was Stephen it was S A I think Stephen A. Meek was the one who got who had it back in nineteen oh nine and then and it's handed down, right? But I notice now it's all chopped up into tents. So I believe Mike Crop or one of the crops, whichever crop went in and got their right to do that. So they now have like eight I think there's eight tens there now. Not that they're gonna build on them but yeah, I know what it's like to fight the government over land. It's not fun. Which property is that? What's he talking about? Now? When you come Aunt up, Lucy, Aunt Lucy's. What? Aunt Lucy's property. That's not Dersham Road, though. Is it? No. That's Mount. No. Now they renamed it Mountaindale. That's Mountaindale Road. They named it Mountaindale. Uh, which one? The, one of them. One of them goes straight. You go past the glider port, 
and then it goes straight to the right over to Pumpkin Ridge, right? It's that straight stretch. It's not when very long. When you come past the Blader Port, yeah. coming this way, yeah. you come out and there's a little corner place there, which is the Meek place, what's left of the Meek hmm. place. Then the next place is Marty Crop. He yeah. built his shop in there in the house. Yeah. Okay. Then there's a group of trees that belongs to Mike Crop. Oak trees. And next to that was Eva Meek and Clarence Meek's yeah. place. And Mike Crop bought that from Eva. Okay. And he built that real fancy house up there. Up the same driveway. It's a Okay. Behind yeah. Clarence Meeks. That's house. probably what I'm thinking of. I think so. And then the next place was Aunt Lucy's house, which is yeah. Now that I heard. Was, I heard Mike. That was you know, Mike. Mike, what? Passed, Mike died suddenly. Out of yeah. Yes, he pulled of, a fast one on me. Went to bed Saturday night. Didn't is that your family, the Crops? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Crop is your family? No. Just He's friends. A very good. His. His. My yes. aunt. Was his. By marriage, was a Crop. Mm -hmm. Was his aunt? I did a lot of work for Lawrence Crop in between ships. That Mike's dad. Shipping out. Yeah. Mike's father. Yes. Yeah. Lawrence. Yeah. Mike's yeah. done a lot of farming. Mike and Marty both have done a lot of farming for clients of ours, um, mm -hmm. and they do a good job, you know. And they're gonna. And boy, it's too bad Mike passed because they just gotten all their land stuff figured out with North Plains and the Lakeview Farms. I mean, they had nothing but a wide open future Area. he could have done I don't know how old he was was he 70 five no, Mike is 19 years younger than I am okay be 71 in his office he's got blueprints of everything he was going to build in North Plains mm. and everything he would have already started but the city voted him no slow down yeah. And he couldn't, so he Mike got a, a bill passed where the city couldn't vote against what he did. Yeah. And he bought one of my, be a cousin, I guess, uh, the Vanders and in place in North in Banks, mm -hmm. right behind the Brown Derby. Yeah, he bought that. Yeah, that was a big because thing. that's going to come they into didn't town. Want, the kids didn't want to farm. Right. He's got blueprints in his office of everything he was going to do there. He showed them to me. And that land's going to be brought in for housing. So Marty and the family are set up really quite great. Well, there's five. Well, there's four girls, I think, and a boy. So. Well, they're a very yeah. important part of Washington County history in the more modern era because the only, of everything you did. Yeah. Uh, the day he died, we were on our way to church. Hmm. And we went by and there was a fire truck sitting there and some cars. And I turned to Jeannie and I said, damn, I said, I just know that Mike Crow passed away last night really you knew yeah. and so we got to church and I was talking to some of the people about it so we got home Sunday and we get a phone call he did pass away mm. now sometimes you just know you know and uh, yeah and they were pretty close you guys were close friends yeah yeah he was pretty close to Mike. did he look up to you as a, as a no. uncle or I got a lot from him. We we were good friends, he and I. Yeah. He had, he bought a little cabin. Keep, oh, keep my hearing aids or I have to turn okay. it up. Uh, he okay. bought a little cabin on the coast because he had these boats mm. go fishing all the mm. time. He's a great fisherman. Huh. So one day I'm sitting there and I says, I heard you bought a cabin on the coast. He says, yeah. He says, uh, you want to use it, Stan? He says, uh, I'll come over and get a key. And, but he said, be sure to leave $50 on the table for the maid to clean up after you leave. 
He said, stay as long as you want. Did you go? Yeah, Jeannie and I went down there. Oh, good. And Took us that little time. cabin turned out to be about a million and a half condo on the Columbia mm. River, looking right out over. And when the cruise ship come up the river, yeah. I could have thrown a baseball bat and hit him. Wow. Out of ball. I was that close. We've been there two, three times. Well, let's go. Let's and, uh, we'll we'll kind of bring this all back to you guys, and then we'll wrap it up because we got about an hour and a half of good 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 history here. So you raised the kids. Uh, you stayed together sixty-seven years now, maybe longer. Sixty-eight. We bought a house in Verbort and lived there about eight years, and then decided it only had one acre. We yeah. decided we better get more acreage, you, so we found this place up here. And this is where you did you you grow up here? Well, so you know we were in Klamath Falls, and then we moved to Verbort. Yep. And um, and then from Verbort we moved here. So this is where we lived when I was in junior high and high school. Gotcha. And you've been here ever since. Yes, I'll probably die right here. Well, I hope so, rather than some oh, hospital hopefully. bed or somewhere you don't want to be. Hopefully. There's no place else I'd rather be. Uh, this property is, I looked it up a little bit, um, despite the property boundary disputes, which were obvious, uh, uh, obvious issues that you resolved, it's uh, very forested up here, but we're kind of at the top of the mountain, aren't we? A little bit. A thousand feet, yeah. What's it been like living up here all these years? It's been great. The only sad thing is, right now the weather is all mixed up, doesn't know what to do. Right. But uh, We've had, in the years we've been here, we've had up to five and a half foot of snow out here. Right. This year, I'd have to go look on my calendar, 18 inches, I believe, is the most we've had. Right. So all these years, have you noticed a consistent weather pattern change? I mean, do you think yes. this whole thing about climate, climate change is for real? Or do you think we're just in a weird... Everything was real good until this year, uh, or this winter time. Uh, rainfall is basically the same. Right. Anywhere from uh, 100 and... 10 inches of rain to 135. Hmm. That's never changed. But because of the way the weather has been, right now, nothing's growing the way it should. Our laurel hedge out here that looks like I just trimmed it is supposed to be trimmed in, Mar or in August and February. I never even touched it last winter, and mm. it, it's not growing. There's nothing to trim. Huh, interesting. In February. It's not just, enough sunlight, maybe, or what? No, it's been uh, freezing temperatures. Yeah. And then gets too hot, okay. warm. So the plants down. don't know what to do. They, uh, they're confused. We had, uh, what, two and a half? To three inches of snow last week. Hmm. Day after Easter. You do get a lot of snow up here. We don't realize it down in the valley. Yes. Because you're at the thousand foot mark. And it stays, you know, even. Have you had elk, black bear, mountain lions, all that stuff up here? Elk. 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 Not yeah. recently, though. How many? No, no, it's probably been almost uh, eight years since we. Had elk in the. But you've had them a lot of them over yeah, the years. Yeah, before week. that, there's we got pictures of elk just all over the pasture out here, so. It's a beautiful property. It's it is. We had elk beef honey up. The year I got my hip tore apart. No. That's when we went out and shot them. I was on the crutches. Okay, go And we shot it. two elk. How long was that? What? That was a long time ago, Daddy. That was quite a while ago. No. But in the past... It hasn't know, been quite a while. It's only some, been about four years. Here's something interesting. Go look it up. Most people 
down in the valley on right. Dairy Creek or on PGE Power. Yeah. There's a little section up here of us that are on West Oregon Electric and it comes over the hill from Vernonia. Yeah. So we used to be without power a lot because they would take care of Vernonia first and mm -hmm. then work out on all the other legs. Yeah. We were three weeks at one time when the kids were in high school without power. We did our schoolwork by lantern. Oh, how fun. Yeah, that was the most interesting. You heat with wood, or is that... that dot, that's that, propane, propane today, but it okay. was it wood. It was wood, but there's a <laughs> fireplace too. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the marriage and then wrap it up. I want to know how you stay together. This is a question people always ask. Couples that couples that stay together, people view as successful in the marriage or in life. Now, maybe some stay together because they don't have anywhere else to go. Mm -hmm. You guys look like this has been a real good thing for you. I mean, obviously, I can tell. But what made it work this far and how? what advice would you have? Because if any of these, anybody listens to any their elders who have had good experiences or bad, either or, or then there's something to be learned here. So tell me about the marriage and why, why it's worked. Well, when you have a difference and uh, you don't want to argue about it, you just keep your mouth shut until the other person cools down hmm. where you can discuss it, talk about it. Never argue or disagree hotly uh, in front of the children. Hmm. We've never, we've always said, we'll wait till they're all in bed, you know, and then discuss it. Never go to bed um, with a chip on your shoulder. Mm. Solve it before you go to bed. So, he, <clears throat> he worked away when he was working with the diesel, um, the company in Portland. Yeah. What? Howard? Anyway. He was gone sometimes a week at a time, you know, just home on the weekends. So that put a lot of pressure on the kids because we had animals. We had sheep sure. and cows and everything. So you had a lot of sheep up, so, up here at one time. Yeah. 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 The so, other thing is, once you retire, like I did, and you got to remember when you got a place like this, we work together outside as well as inside. Right. And that's the way it should be. I mean, just because your wife is a woman doesn't mean she's got to stand there and be a maid to you and right. do everything for you. you got to do things too. Right. So right now, she cooks, I clean. And do the dishes. I'm and a dishwasher. And that's been that way for you guys. Just and since he retired. Oh, since I've been retired, yeah, she, which is she quite was our a few dishwasher years. before that. <laughs> well, people, uh, people when they retire, I've noticed, you know, if they don't have anything to keep them going, they dwindle, or they just. We have friends that retired, sat down to watch TV, and, and they they're died. all dead. Yeah. And yeah, it feels like when you're in that when you're in that struggle to keep going and take care of everybody, you're sort of your life sort of got a lot of energy and a pressure and all that, and then all of a sudden the air goes out of that balloon, and you just kind of I think some people just sit down and they just don't exactly they don't have that thing to keep going. The thing is, yeah. if you want to sit around and worry about everything, they call that stress. Yeah. Now, you cannot do that. You got to let that stuff go. There's so many people with so much stress right now. And that guy right there. That stupid machine in there. Yeah. That they call a TV. Yeah. You don't turn it on in the morning and sit around and watch yeah. it all day. That's why I quit watching the news. It, it, they they talked about this that many generations have gotten up in the morning over a coffee turn that thing on and they watch all the world's problems then they go about their day but the whole day that stuff eats away at you you know what that is yeah i do we get up in the morning i got one just a little different that one. Oh, that's pretty that was made out of a nuclear bomb okay. we wow. we make these i see that 
and and you give them out. We get up in the morning and sit, sit down here. I'll drink two or three cups of coffee, and we make groceries. We belong to a group. After we say our prayers. Most people don't know what a prayer is. Right. Unless, uh, well, during the war, you'd be surprised how many atheists were praying. Were praying. Yeah. yeah. But these Wait. these yeah. rosaries are sent all over the world. How to, do you know where to send them? To different missions. We oh. get a bulletin, a monthly bulletin, and the, the North Plains rosaries are taken into Portland at a distribution center at a Catholic church, and they go down the list and then they send them off to where they're these. needed. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. A little, and, uh, a little bit of you yeah. and your faith goes with that Just, rosary every time. Yeah. The priest in there that's in charge of this, uh, we were just in a couple of years ago to visit him, and he's still going, 98 years old or 99. Wow. wow. And he enters them all in a, in a book, and he's got this book that's probably 100 years old. <laughs> and he knows where they went. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of neat, really. So you stay busy. Leave, oh yeah, you got to stay busy. Leave stress behind. Keep. Don't go to bed mad. I also understand you guys stay in the same bed, which some people don't. At least that was in the article I read. We I need you in my bed. He can't even lay on the couch and take a nap. He's a big. He's, he's a big softy. He's got to have. Got to have you right there. Right. Nobody's. He's not snoring and keeping you up all night. But you're in great shape. You're not. Have you been ever been heavy in your life? Have you always been thin? <laughs> the most I've ever weighed in my life was 162 pounds, and that was when I was at Sagamo Prison. I was on the boxing team. That's the most I've ever weighed. I think that's genetic, dietary, or just some of both. I think it's both. Genetic. There's not genetic a fat, there's not and a fat what we eat in this family. I don't eat a lot of junk food. Right. But he also, you work outside. And we work. Yeah. We go outside. Cut Boy, if, firewood. If there's one, you cut firewood? Oh, yeah. Good for you. We got that. Well, physically, yeah. you both look about a decade or a decade and a half younger than your age would say. In my, this is my yes. opinion, having met a lot of people. And that act, that idea, like I'm looking at his hands. And your hand, skin is supple. You hands look strong. You know you're not all arthritic. Well, not all of them. See that? <laughs> yeah. What's going on there? Oh well. That's I a, did that when I was a kid. Child. I split it. it with an axe, and my housekeeper that was teaching me to play piano got real mad at me and said I did it on purpose so I wouldn't have to play oh. the piano. <laughs> oh. Did you end up playing the piano? Well, I played the piano for years and years. Okay. My way. But see, that's a lot. That's a childhood injury. That's not like exactly. Well, anyway, you're a great example uh, of somebody that had a successful life. Nothing was handed to you, as far as I can see. I'll tell you something else. Everybody, I don't care who you are, you're going to have aches and pains. Yeah. If you want to sit around and dwell on that stupid ache you got, you're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. Get out. And do something and forget about it. Mm -hmm. Not many people that are hitting ninety don't have a prescription to take. Yeah, I'm, yeah, he mentioned that. You know, that's if that's anybody it. you talk to, you know. Well, they got a whole shelf full. Just, yeah. yeah, they get you on one thing, then you have to take something to counterbalance that, and so on and so on. Yeah. And I'm hoping that I think I have only had one I've had to take, and I'm trying to figure out how to stop that one. So. You have what? I have one medication I have to take for gout, and I quit taking it, and it created a big problem. So I got to get my weight down. I have in the past, but it's genetic. Gout's not a lot of fun because it's pain, super painful. Is it mostly in your feet? Well, that's where it starts, and then after a number of years, then it moves up to your hands. So I've noticed I'm getting, oh. I'm getting, you get, yeah, you'll get a lot of that. And you can end up pretty crippled up with it. So it's uh, hmm. 
What, what's your nationalities in closing out? I never, I touched on that. Do you know what your nationality is? Have you done oh, your, yes. What is it? <laughs> Let me start up here. Scottish. Okay. English. Irish. Welsh. Dutch. Spanish. And Basque. Okay. That I know of. There might be others. I'm not sure. Um, on my mother's side, I would say I'm a 100% Dutch. Dutch. All the rest is on my father's side, and they were seafaring people. So it could I be. I always said they just took what they damn well wanted as they went. That sounds like Norwegian, like my people. What? That sounds like Norwegians, like my people. They just did whatever they wanted off the ocean, you know. Well, maybe you'll get your DNA done one of these days. I think the daughter-in-law over here has. She had. And what's had your taken the rod? What is what is your uh, your heritage, uh, Gene? Heinz fifty-seven. Okay. Well, he kind of is too, but he's got a real heavy Central uh, Northern European island, you know, British Isles. They claim the Barnes is uh, English. Um, several of the men have this. A small finger that goes down, and it's they that's, say that that goes back to that's unusual Scotland or somewhere, yeah, yeah. But it's inherited. My yeah. brothers have it, my dad had it, and it's very and, unusual. Do you have it? Well, kind of, it, it's mainly in the boys, it's mainly in the boys, but I've unusual. I've been noticing that I'm starting to get a contracture drawing it in, yeah. Your fingers so. get kind of tied up tight. Yep. Every once in a while you see somebody with, with these fingers just glued down here, you know. Yeah. And my brother had, oper Don, he had operation, you know, yeah. on him. That's called, that. so I, I have that. I have trigger finger, so I can't, right yeah. now, I can't get that finger to go back, but if you listen to it. Well, you got to push it. It pops. Yeah. Wow. And there's a cartilage in there. You see that ball? Yeah. <laughs> if I read. He reads a lot. My the old ball. fingers start getting cramps. I gotcha. So I just change hands, use this hand, and I'll do 50 of these. Okay. Then I'll put them on this side and do 50. Well, I'm going to take and that. And I might do that two, I'm gonna three take, times I'm going to take night. that one away. I used to have one of those Did back you? in the day when I was doing weightlifting and all that stuff because that was a grip. We had those grip things too, those squeezy yeah. things. Well, yeah. But this, uh, to me, is better a ball than a grip thing. It's because it's natural. Yeah. You're only going one way. If you put this in here, you got all your fingers working yeah. real good. And it's pushing back in all directions. Yeah. I'd get a ball, and, but you got to use it all the time. Not just, when, oh, well, I'll do that. Set it I, down, yeah. You, uh, you can't just quit things. Here's something else, our son, Mike. Oh, yeah. You've seen these. Yeah, those are uh, they're a Chinese thing, they're like Qigong or something. They're yeah. an energy thing, and they help your hand. Yeah. They make a nice sound, too. Well, we're learning all kinds of stuff up here on the mountain today, and uh, I can't thank the two of you enough for the sit-down. And the good thing about a oral history like this is versus videotape, which could be lost, or something else, this particular format can live on for a long time. So hopefully, I just listen to, a, I go to the Pacific University website and I listen to histories. There's about 500 of them on there and I'm sure you may even have some family who have left them, but I've listened to about 10 of them and uh, I learn something every time I listen. Because you can read whatever you want in the book and to your point about Joe Meek and some of the stories that have been told about Meek, well, he basically is like Pecos Bill. Everything about him became so big now he kind of fed that a little bit because then there's a lot of truth to it but in this case i'm hearing your voices and nobody can ever doubt what you said versus something that was written later so. here's what joe meek wrote in his diary that eva gave me to read his he had this thing written when he was 65 years old and he was laughing about it he said they make a big deal about me, but he said, we were out hunting, and that's when he had this Indian bride. Yep. And we were 
I had gone ahead scouting things out, and I come back to the bunch, and I said, uh, where's, I think, it, uh, Mount Positive, I think it was the one named Virginia. That's the wife he brought here. And he said, where is she? And they said, well, she had trouble with the mule, the pack. And so she said, to keep going, I'll catch up with you. So he goes up on back to see what she was up to because she should have been there. So he gets up on top of this hill and here's a bunch of Indians down there going to take her everything. And he said, people say that I rushed down there shooting at them to drive them off. And he said, that's not true at all. He said, and this is what history says. In his book, he said, I let out a big scream and that stupid mule I was on took off like hell down the, heck, down the hill towards him. And what choice did I have? Yeah. <laughs> and so he chased the end. He's a victim of circumstance. And just like, and he also mentioned about, he went into this cave. And sure, I didn't go in there to kill bears. Yeah, the bear cave story, yeah. He said, yeah. I had no choice. Yeah. This He's female mother bear come running out there with two cubs. What else choice did I have? Yeah. I had to survive. I didn't go. To, and, but the history is making it sound like he did that deliberately. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of other things he wrote. Well, I'm going to turn the recording off. Thank you guys for the time today. i got to be careful how I do this. Um, this is Dirk Knutson, and uh, today is April 12th, 2018, and uh, I'm finishing up with Stan and Jean Long. Yes. Thank you guys very much. You're welcome.